for Latin 2302, Intermediate Latin 2, Virgil and Italy, at Trinity University, Spring 2020, this is Dr. Benjamin Eldon Stevens. This presentation is on the fundamentals of scansion required for recitation of classical Latin poetry in meter. I'll start with an example, which can serve as a model for some linguistic and artistic goals in recitation. From Virgil's Georgics, Book 1, Lines 493 to 497. Scilicet et tempus veniet cum finibus illis agricol incurvo terram molitus aratro exes inveniet scabra robigene pila aut gravibus rastris caleas pulsabit inanis grandia que fossis mirabitur osa sepulcris. As the example should indicate, Recitation is reading a poem or part of a poem aloud, in the Latin phrase, we wa woke, and in meter, whether from text or from memory. By meter, we mean a poem's patterned arrangement of syllables, and the process of determining a poem's meter is called scansion. On this slide, the passage shows every word separated into its syllables, indicated by hyphens, and those syllables organized into groups, separated by vertical lines, groups called feet. Foot here is an English translation of the classical Latin term pace, which in turn was a translation of the ancient Greek term for measurement, metron, hence the term meter. In classical Latin poetry, Scansion determines a poem's meter by identifying syllables as either long or short. In antiquity, the preferred concepts seem to have been rather heavy and light, but length and shortness capture more accurately what matters for the meter, especially for recitation. On this slide, the passage marks every long syllable with a horizontal line above it called a macron. By convention, every short syllable usually is marked with a small open half circle above it like a simplified letter U. I've omitted short marks from the passage here, since, strictly speaking, every syllable that isn't marked as long is scanned as short. That omission will help the passage be less cluttered. But here's an example of how short and long marks combine to form the schematic diagram of a meter. In this example, dactylic hexameter, so called because there are six metra, or feet, and each foot is a dactyl, that is, in the notional shape of a finger, with a long syllable followed by two short syllables. Each set of two short syllables can be switched out for one long syllable, and the final or sixth foot has only two syllables no matter what. We'll say just a bit more about dactylic hexameter toward the end of the lesson. In the meantime, what matters is that this is the only meter our example author Virgil uses, and so we'll expect to see a version of it in every one of his lines. Now, how does scansion work? There are four elements or steps to scansion. Here's an overview with details to follow. The first and second steps of scansion go together. A syllable can be scanned or identified as long for one or both of two reasons. The first reason is called by nature. The second reason, by position. To make long syllables a bit more obvious, on this slide, every long syllable in the first line of the passage is marked in red. By implicit contrast, every not-red syllable in that line is scanned as short. Once the first and second steps have been taken, the third step is to account for what's called elision, that is, the loss of syllables under certain predictable conditions. The lost syllables are said to be elided or dropped out. The term elision is in scare quotes here because the actual practice in antiquity seems to have been rather a slurring together of the relevant syllables, which in Greek is called synaloipe. But for our purposes in recitation, 
elision is simpler. Every elided syllable in the passage has been put into parentheses. To draw that out more clearly, on this slide, they've also been marked in yellow. Finally, once syllables have been scanned and elision accounted for, we incorporate word accent or stress and what's called ictus, the beat of foot-based poetry. This interaction between Latin's natural word accent and its cultural or, as it were, artificial meters is a chief source of the musicality of classical Latin poetry. On this slide, every accented or stressed syllable is marked with an acute accent over the vowel. To draw that out a bit more clearly, on this new slide, every stressed syllable in the first line is now also set in italics. Back to the simplest formatting of the completely scanned passage. Our goal for the rest of the lesson is to explain each of the steps of scansion in turn, to account for how the passage has been scanned, and, on that basis, to make possible your own scansion of other examples from classical Latin, which can then be prepared for recitation. Scansion depends on identifying every syllable as either long or, if not long, short. A syllable can be scanned as long for one or both of two reasons. The first called by nature, the second by position. A syllable is long by nature if it contains either a long vowel, like the ablative plural case ending is, or a diphthong, that is, any combination of two vowel letters that is pronounced as a single combined sound, like the sound i. A syllable is long by position, roughly speaking, if its vowel is followed by two or more consonants. The details are more complicated, but most important, any two consonants, even the same two, for example, the double L in puella, but sometimes not a combination of a stop, p, t, k, b, d, g, and a liquid, l, or r. Sometimes that combination does not make position. Let's look at each of these reasons for syllabic length in our passage from Virgil. On this slide, every syllable that is long by nature is marked in red. That is, marked in red is every long vowel. As it happens, this passage includes no diphthongs. Now, we've marked every such syllable with a macron. How to know if a vowel is long by nature? Partly memorization for example, of case endings and other predictable forms, and partly by reading, scanning, and reciting a lot of poetry. That way, the quantities will become more naturally fixed in place. Moving on to step two. On this slide, every syllable that is scanned as long by position is marked in yellow. Every syllable whose vowel is followed by two or more consonants. Now we can add macrons over those long syllables, too. In practice, until you've memorized a solid core of vowels that are long by nature, length by position is an easier and more reliable place to start. Just look for every example of a vowel followed by two or more consonants. With every long syllable marked, the third step is to account for elision, the loss of syllables in certain predictable conditions. The main condition is this. When a word ends in a vowel, and the next word begins in a vowel, the first vowel is elided or dropped out. On this slide, the elided syllables are marked in parentheses. Now the elided syllables are picked out in yellow. Agricola elides into incurvo, agricol incurvo, excesa into enweniet, excesin veniet, and grandiaque into ephosis, grandiaque fossis. Incidentally, the rule for elision can be described algebraically as here. A word ending in a vowel plus a word beginning in a vowel results in only the second vowel remaining. The parenthetical M and H mean that word final M does not prevent elision, and word initial H 
also does not prevent elision. In other words, a word is considered to end in a vowel even if it ends in M, and a word is considered to begin in a vowel even if it ends in H. Both of those conditions still allow elision. The fourth step is to incorporate word accent or stress and metrical beat or ictus. This step matters because, again, the interaction between qualitative accent and quantitative meter is a big part of the musicality of classical Latin poetry. Happily, the rule for stress placement in Latin is simple. If the penult, the next to last syllable of a word, is long, then that long penult is stressed. If the penult is short, the antepenult, the before the next to last syllable, if it exists, takes the stress. If there is no antepenult, it's still the penult that takes the stress, even if the penult is short. As before, all the stressed syllables here are marked with acute accents. On this slide, every long syllable in the first line is marked in red. Now, each syllable that also takes the word stress is set in italics. Do you see why those syllables are stressed and not others? Finally, ictus, a metrical beat that is a function of any foot-based meter. On this slide, every ictus in the first line is marked in yellow. Notice that, in dactylic hexameter, the ictus is the first syllable, the long syllable, at the start of every foot. Of interest is the interaction between accent and ictus. When they coincide or match, it's called homodyne. When they clash, it's called heterodyne. On this slide, only the homodyne feet are shown. Notice the coincidence between stress and ictus. By contrast, on this slide, only the heterodyne feet are shown. Notice the clash between accent and ictus, including in the et cum foot, where there are two stressed syllables, but each a monosyllable and only one ictus. Here are both types of feet together, homodyne and heterodyne. Once all four steps in scansion have been taken, the poem is ready for recitation. Ski licet et tempus veni et cum finibus illis agricolin curvo terram molitus aratro exes in veni et scabra ro vigine pila aut gravibus rastris galeas pulsabit inanis grandia que fossis mirabitur ossa sepulcris. Again, it's helpful to know in advance when a poem uses a certain meter. Thus, Virgil's poetry is all in dactylic hexameter. Knowing that makes the work of scansion easier. And finally, of course, it matters, too, what the poem is about. The meaning should inform any recitation. Here is an English translation of our passage from Virgil. Surely a time will come when in those regions a farmer, softening the earth with curved plow, will discover spears consumed by scabrous rust, or strike empty helmets with his heavy hose, and wonder at huge bones in their dug-up graves. With that meaning in mind, and hopefully with its scansion more comprehensible after the lesson, here once more is a recitation of Virgil's Latin. Sci licet et tempus veniet cum finibus illis agricol incurvo terram molitus aratro exes in veniet scabra rubigene pila aut gravibus rastris Galeas pulsabit inanis, grandia que fossis mirabitur ossa sepulcris. <laughs>